Hey, what's up? My name is Jake Snodgrass. I am a, uh, a chaplain here in the United States Army Garrison Humphreys. I am the Plants and Operations Chaplain. I serve, have been here about a year. I also function as the lead pastor of Agape Humphreys, and that is a contemporary Protestant service here on the installation. So if you don't know about chapel services and how they run, usually installations have a, a variety of chapel services that, that take care and provide um, religious services and opportunities for service members to be involved and, and practice their faith. And so um, my role here is to lead um, this chapel service, and and it looks a little bit different than a, a regular chapel service. It has a lot more um, to it than the average uh, average place. A lot of times they they just kind of function based on the rhythms of the installation, training, and things like that. We're a place where people come and just do a worship service and split. Um, but here. Um, we have a handful of ministries that are really designed to be reproducible, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to, to talk to you today. One of the issues that um, I've been asked about multiple times is we operate kind of and utilize the missional community model. The missional community model uh, is not brand new. Uh, there's a lot of people who have great discussions about this that I would recommend that you go check out. Um, Saturate the World, those uh, resources and website. They have a podcast as well that rehash a lot of these issues. I'm going to use a lot of the same language as they did. Originally, I was trained um, and partnered with um, SOMA communities when I originally was assessed at Acts 29 when I was at Fort Lewis, Washington. I mean, that's where um, I learned a lot of these principles. Um, guys like Abe Meisenberg um, and Jeff Vanderstel and a, and a handful of others who really um, I got to listen to and, and, and understand. So so when I use phrases and things like that, a lot of that comes from them, um, and a lot of the stuff comes from Tim Chester and Steve Timmis and their books, Everyday Church and, and Total Church, and then um, Jeff Vanderstelt's obviously his book, Saturate, which are all really helpful. Um, but I want to clarify kind of how missional communities tend to function in a military community, what they are. And for a lot of uh, military folks, they may not know exactly what a missional community is. They They've been a part of <clears throat> churches or they've been a part of small groups and things like that, but maybe they haven't encountered something uh, quite like this. We only run into a handful of people who have really understood it, and I just want to break down exactly what it is and what and how it differs really um, from your kind of standard small group. Um, and so um, a lot of this, a lot of the, the questions regarding missional communities uh, usually revolve around, hey, aren't, aren't, is this just another name for small groups? And it isn't. So what I want to just specify for you exactly what we're expecting and what we think of and what we're using to um, to mean when we say mission community. So don't just assume, hey, so you see he's just talking small groups. It's just a, a classy name uh, for it because it's not. Okay, so um, first and foremost, I want to talk about how and why they're formed. So when I was a pastor at Ames Baptist Church, I thought I was super um, ingenious. Um, I told my congregation, hey, no, nobody's really doing this. <laughs> and... Um, what we were doing is we were, we were trying to get small groups going, which in a really small town where churches have been structured the same way for hundreds of years, this is a really hard turn to make in a very short period of time. And so I always recommend people do this over a long period of time. And really in a small in a small town church where there's only 50 people, you almost have a small group missional community right there. Anyway, that's all, another story for another day. And the uh, travails of passing a church when you're 26 years old. But when I um, brought this up, I, I, I wanted to understand our small groups weren't just going to be a place where um, we would take people, bring people into church, attract people into, into the congregation through uh, the quality of service or through events or things like that. And those things aren't necessarily bad in themselves. They certainly are good. And we need to create multiple on-ramps where people can access the church in a variety of different ways. But... Um, Usually how the model goes, you, you attract people to the congregation, then you get them into small groups. And that kind of sustains them, disciples them, and kind of closes the back door, so to speak, of people who are visiting the church and then getting connected. So, and not getting connected. So they are getting connected in small groups. They build those relationships and they stay longer and then are discipled and, and they grow. Those small groups form kind of a, a place where they can talk about the sermon, um, a lot of times grow in their faith. Um, but there, but there become some natural problems with the small groups. Is directionally speaking about how that it flows is that you're really relying on your service or your events to draw people to the church, and so it ignores a couple of things, right? One, it ignores the reality that current culture, and especially in the military culture, hundreds and hundreds of people. It doesn't matter what type of event you're putting on, or the quality of service you have. 
I mean, I could be riding out on a motorcycle every week with smoke, and we could be rock showing it up. We could have you two as uh, our band, and I could be the greatest preacher of all time. And it doesn't really matter to a bulk of the people that are on our installation that we're in the military, right? So they're not coming to church. Um, they have no intentions uh, of being involved in a, a chapel community. And so on Sunday morning, they don't have the inclination or the feeling like I should be in church. And so when you really cater um, all of your ministry to this kind of attractional model that really attracts people based on an event or attracts people based on the quality of service, what you do is you really just attract believers. And so you're really just creating a market share issue that you're providing a better product or a better uh, cup of coffee, so to speak, than your competitor. And so that's not what we want to do. And um, oftentimes when you do that and then you put people in small groups, your small groups are reflective of that. And so with your small groups and become this very insular um, kind of places where people um, kind of form that kind of click type of community. And then so they, they can be helpful, don't get me wrong, um, but, they are, but they're definitely not missional communities. And so what we, what we mean by missional communities is actually inverting um, how we attract um, believers and what we're doing is not necessarily creating events or creating a product to attract people. We're actually allowing the gospel and the church in of itself to be the attraction, so to speak. And what I mean by that is, um, for us um, at Agape, one of the things that we always will say is that um, we, you know, are created in the image of a triune God, and we exist. And this triune God existed eternally in perfect loving community, and we. We are created in his image. We, we hammer that over and over in Genesis 1, 26. It says, you know, he created us in his image. And it repeats that. So we're created in his image. And if we want to image God um, and we want to live um, like um, he's called us to live, then we live in community as um, that models um, our tri- the, the Trinity. And so, um, and then uh, Soma and, and a lot of these guys have really highlighted this First Peter 2, 9 aspect of, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession. This First Peter two nine, that you may proclaim the excellencies excellencies of him who called out of darkness into his marvelous light, and that is kind of idea. This family of servant missionaries, this this trinitarian formula that we get even out of the out of the our, our baptism identity, when you're buried um, with with Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. We say, I baptize you now. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and that kind of Father that we're His family, um, the Son that we are um, servants. He came to be uh, not to be served, but to serve, and give His life as ransom for many. Mark ten forty five, and then missionaries that the Holy Spirit has sent out um, to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus Christ, and He works in us to proclaim the message of the gospel. And that kind of Trinitarian model that we image God when we live as a family of servant missionaries. That kind of idea is that we are taking the church um, into the community. And it's not just, I hear that a lot, you know, get the church out of the front door. It doesn't mean that you're just hosting services outside, or it doesn't mean that you're just doing nice things, or you're living your faith out on an everyday basis, you know, in the, in the model, the kind of idea that we tend to put forward. Or, you know, we, but it's about living in community on mission in your neighborhood. So if you were to do this, you would see you know, a group of people who are um, loving each other well, living in community, and, and proclaiming and growing in their faith in Jesus Christ and inviting their neighbors in the community alongside with them as they serve with them, as they serve them, as they live out in a rhythm of everyday life with them. And so um, this type of attractional model, basically, as, as I've heard multiple times, the guys at Soma say is, you know, you're living in such a way that demands a gospel explanation. And that living in such a way that demands a gospel explanation doesn't mean that we're um, living out our sermon and not talking about Jesus. Um, it definitely means we're talking about Jesus on a regular and, and consistent basis. We're talking about how the gospel's changed our lives. We're talking about um, the application in day-to-day um, situations, how God, we're not believing the gospel or are believing the gospel based on the context and the situations that we find ourselves in. Um, certainly a lot of circumstances in our life where we're allowed to think through the gospel's implications and those details. But as we do that as a family and point one another to the gospel, what that does is it really, as we're living that in community in our neighborhood, uh, it allows people who maybe have never would get up in the morning and go to church on a Sunday morning, allows them to rub shoulders with them. And as we're living in rhythm with them and serving them in the neighborhood, 
it allows them to see the church, to experience the church, and get their uh, get the initial um, step onto those on ramps into missional community and its regular um, gospel believing type of uh, world, essentially, um, where they would never have experienced the gospel in any real way um, without that community um, living right there in their midst. And so, what you see is is an inversion, essentially. Of the attraction model, that your attraction is the people of God living on mission. Um, your attraction is um, people living in such a way that actually puts some teeth to what they believe about the gospel. And when they when they do that, people are like, "Oh my gosh, see, it's taken hold of their life. It really matters to them. Um, the gospel really does have implications for their day to day lives. And so it's not just some kind of club." I'm exchanging some rule and, and situation beliefs, or it's not just kind of this experience where I'm supposed to go and, and get some help along my way. It is about a reorientation of all of my life to believe the gospel. And so um, when they see that, that is the attraction. And we always say things like, you know, we jokingly um, say, you know, how, however you get people into the door of your, your congregation is how you're going to keep them. And so we want the people of God to be the attractional model as they live out the gospel. We want the gospel to be put on clear display um, for our community. And the gospel is putting on a clear display when we love one another. Jesus really talks about um, in, in John you know, 13 through 15 about loving one another. This is how they will know that you are mine, that you love one another, that you are to love me. And if you love me, you're keeping your, my commandments and I will reveal myself to you. That kind of idea that comes out of that that kind of communion um, that comes between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and then includes us, then begins to include others. We invite them to a table. We invite them to lunch, to dinner. Uh, we live life with them. We show up at their games. We get to know their families. We get to know their kids. And in a sense, really, we, we're living on mission right there. So what we want to do is we want to equip people um, to live out their faith in their community um, with other believers so that the love that... Um, that they have for one another would be the apologetic or would be the thing that is the attractional model, so to speak. And that it would be the access point, or if you think about it, the on-ramp into long-term community. Now, that doesn't mean we don't host big events. We do that together. We, we, we do it all the time. We'll have some, you know, we'll have upcoming, we have the big excellent family adventure, the Easter egg hunt for the community and where we get to know and serve them. But that's a macro model of loving our community versus that kind of micro model, which is done in the normative everyday days of life. A better example of this would be um, the newcomers meal that we have every Thursday night. And then also on for, for incoming service members that are unaccompanied or not married on Monday and Wednesday night, where we go and just serve them a meal, get to know them. And we bring a lot of people alongside of with us to serve with them as well. And it gives us the opportunity really to uh, disciple and to, to show uh, the love of Jesus Christ and those things. So, um, those types of things, those communities who go and serve, those those embody that kind of missional community spirit that we want to reproduce. Now, when you're doing that and you're studying the word together and you're you're growing in your faith with one another, um, what happens is that these become a really reproducible models of the church. Um, if I wanted to go and really restart or start a uh, a church, or if I wanted to uh, reproduce or do church planting in a, in a sense. Um, in the military context, I don't need to have a building. I don't need to have um, a big sound system. I don't need to have a big worship team. Um, and, and certainly we have all those things uh, here at Agape in the sense of the, 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 the major gathering that we have on a weekly basis. However, um, these reproducible models essentially are about people living out the everyday mission of, and, and normative life. And that's a reproducible model. We can do that anywhere and in any context, whether I deploy to have Afghanistan, or I'm I'm back home in the states, or I'm I'm here in Korea. I don't uh, I'm not reliant upon um, a certain. Tr- I can just start building relationships wherever I'm at. I'm eating with people, inviting them into my home, um, studying the word together, and then we begin to live life on mission uh, together. And we can do that in any way, in any context. And so for us, we we believe this facilitates a, a, a quicker, reproducible model that really in the military, based on the transient culture in which we have. Uh, creates really the long game. So you know, we have some, some short short game goals and some long game goals. And the long game goal is this is a long term investment into people. And you know, um, a lot of times people have a certain moments or um, create some momentum based on you know having a great service. Frankly, um, 
military chapels can go in waves. They can they can get really strong based on some leadership, and then they can get really weak based on leadership. Um, and so when we are in a really strong moment, it's great to kind of cheer and say, this is the model to do, and this is how you should should do everything. But when um, when it's not like that, when you um, it's not going well, a lot of times we lose that lose that momentum. And, and what we really want to see is we want to create kind of this um, this engine of spiritual reproducibility um, in the context of the military that kind of overcomes some of those hurdles and some of those uh, so those contacts where it can be a little tough. The reproducible gospel communities can really be reproduced anywhere in any context. And for the chaplain like myself. A lot of times, you know, as we get promoted, and I just had a job change where I became the past, or pastoral coordinator slash plans and operations slash family life guy here at Humphreys. Um, when when we get promoted and we get different jobs, a lot of times we get into admin roles or we get into places where it's hard. The context is just not really there for us. Here's a here's a way you know, in a reproducible gospel community where we can build relationships where we're at, invite people into our home, and reproduce and, and disciple others. Really, and make disciples wherever we're at, and we don't, um, we're not limited by our job or our role or our function. It doesn't matter whether or not we are the lead pastor of the service or we're not the lead pastor of the service. It doesn't matter um, if we've been tasked with a, with a handful of jobs that may not really facilitate long term growth. It, I mean, short term growth. It, but we want to create these habits of developing missional communities and or gospel communities, as we would refer to them where the gospel is being proclaimed, um, the gospel is being lived out, and people are really growing in their faith with Jesus Christ and being able to, uh, to see that community, to be in that community, to live their life in such a way that, like we said, demands a gospel explanation. So with that, for us, it involves, it involves some, some big changing um, and, and changing of how we operate generally. And so as we kind of go in this podcast, we definitely want to get into the details of, of what that looks like. Um, and what, what kind of systems and structures need to be in place? How do we need to be coaching people? What are the, what are the discipleship rhythms? How do we get, um, you know, in a context of a military chapel community, we have lots of auxiliary ministries. How do we get these auxiliary ministries to, to see the vision, to grow in this area, to create reproducible gospel communities? And where's the pushback? Um, within chapel context, what are some of the, the the hard things that we tend to run into, and then how can we overcome those? And I think there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, a lot of ways in which man the future looks really bright in the area of reproducing um, these communities, and also we just see um, the harvest as as being plentiful here, and we know that if we um, labor hard in this area, if we make the gospel clear in this area, if we really re-coach and re, um, um, reorient our lives towards making the gospel clear in everyday moments, man, we're going to see a lot of fruit, um, the long-term discipleship fruit that can produce a lot of disciples, and really the, the idea of multiplication can really take off. So I'm um, looking forward to being in the discussion. We're going to bring some people who are, who are actively doing it um, here on, at Humphreys, and then also uh, be able to connect with some folks uh, Long term, across the military, here we're getting plugged in. But bear with us and, and understand that this is a little bit new um, for myself. And, and and certainly don't take this to mean that we believe we have the best ideas or how things go or we're smarter than everybody. We recognize that, that Jesus is um, the one who's equipped us and called us, and and we really are just kind of sharing um, some understanding that we've gained from others, and then also put into practice. Um, about 10 years of ministry here in the United States Army. So, um, yeah, excited, and we will uh, talk to you soon, um, and we'll be publishing uh, more information on kind of a weekly basis. So have a great day and take care. See you from Humphreys.